I grew up in a family of lifelong St. Louis Cardinals fans. And when I say lifelong, I don't mean just me. I don't mean just my dad. I mean my grandpa, my great grandpa, all of them. Like lifelong St. Louis Cardinals fans. They're all from Jonesboro, Arkansas. And so they've been Cardinals fans for as long as you could possibly imagine. I mean, they were fans back when, when Stan Musial was on the roster. They were ban fans in the 80s when, when Ozzie Smith was killing it and they were having some amazing years. But they were also fans in the dark days, the days like 2023, when they ended up way upside down and way out of first place and not fans for fair weather, right? They were all the time fans. And it's been said of St. Louis Cardinals fans that they are the best fans to, to be fans. I mean, they're, they're among the best fans, but I gotta be honest with you, I have to disagree. I grew up in Chicago and Chicago has its sports teams, right? I mean, the Bears, they've had their good days and bad days, they still have fans, right? The Sox, they have good days, good years and bad years and they still have fans. But, and the Bulls had a big run, right? I mean, for sure in the 90s, man, it was a huge deal. Michael Jordan, all the stuff, Scottie Pippen, all those names were big deals and then they had bad years, good, right? I mean, those are good fans. But there are the Chicago Cubs. 71 years without a National League pennant, uh, 108 years in a row without a World Series win. And to, the fact that they still have a fan is amazing. And, but I think if you're a Cubs fan, you're either glutton for punishment, right? You are either uh, glutton for punishment, you are a fan of losers, or you are one of the best fans known to mankind because you are not just a fair weather fan. Now, if you know me, you know I'm not a sports nut. If you are, are been around here for any minute, you know we're not talking about being fair weather fans. But the reality is we all live in a world where it's difficult at times, isn't it? To be a fan of God in the middle of really difficult circumstances. But what we've been talking about in the last several weeks is this idea that gratitude is a challenge. It's a challenge for us to move forward in our faith story, knowing what God has done for us, and knowing what God is doing right now in the middle of difficult circumstances, but trusting, this is the difficult part, in what God will do in the future. Gratitude like that is a real challenge. In fact, the real challenge starts today, doesn't it? I mean, when we built this series out, we planned it to kind of move us toward, uh, toward Thanksgiving. We figured it would be helpful to kind of build a, a month of gratitude. But really today is what, when the challenge is, right? We're the Sunday after, after Thanksgiving, the Sunday after the gathering, the Sunday after all the stuff. And if you spent a couple of hours with your family this week, my guess is you are today struggling with gratitude, right? You've been around the table, you've, been, I mean, you've said all the thanks, you've expressed it all, and now the real challenge of gratitude begins. The gratitude is really faith living out what's tomorrow. In fact, if you think about it this way, faith is being grateful now for what God has yet to do. And that, that's where the real challenge is, isn't it? I mean, it's one thing to look backwards and go, God, I am so grateful for the things you've done. I'm so grateful for the blessings. I'm so grateful. And it's another thing to know, God, I want the freedom you give me from like d having faith and, and walking in gratitude, even in the middle of difficult circumstances, like Chris talked about last week. But Gratitude for what God will do is, hasn't happened yet. That's really a challenge, isn't it? I mean, the writer of Hebrews says it this way. He says that faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. Faith is having gratitude for what is going to happen, right? Wow, that's, that's what gratitude really is a challenge, right? That's the idea. It's the evidence of things that we can't see. Now, I don't know about you, but man, when I think about evidence and things I can't see, that's really hard for me to, to rack, reconcile, isn't it? It's hard for all of us, right? We can't see it, then how can I have faith in it that it's real evidence? That's really the rub, isn't it? But gratitude really is the simple thing. It's gratitude for what God is going to do is walking in faith today like it already happened yesterday. Now, We've all been in some pretty challenging circumstances, haven't we? We've all had some really rough moments. Maybe you've gone through a divorce and it's been really painful for you. Maybe you were just in the middle of all that pain and it was just overwhelming to you. Or maybe you got a diagnosis that you didn't want to get. 
I mean, anything other than, hey, my fault, I didn't mean to worry you, is a diagnosis I didn't want to get, right? Maybe you've been in the middle of that, or maybe you lost someone that you loved. And at some point in the middle of that difficult circumstance, some well-meaning, right, Christian who came up in the line at the funeral, right, or called you or sent you a text, and they said, hey, don't worry, it's all good, right? They patted you on the back, and they quoted a verse, and they, they kind of said, don't worry, it's all good. And the verse that they were quoting is Romans 8.28. And Romans 8.28 is one of those verses that often gets misquoted. People trying to be sympathetic, but what they wind up being is just regular old pathetic, right? And they go, hey, don't worry about it. Everything's good. It's all good. It's all good. Can I be honest with you? It's not good. A diagnosis you didn't want to get is not good. The, the reality of, of the circumstances in your marriage that have led to this moment are not good. And it's grieving. It's difficult. It's really hard. Losing a loved one, no matter how long their life has been, right? We see those things. People say those things. At least they got to live a good, long life. Losing a loved one is not good. But can we just talk about what, what Paul says versus what Paul doesn't say? Paul, Paul says it this way. This is with the verse that they're trying to quote. It says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Can we just talk about what Paul does not say? Paul does not say that all things are good. He, God works all things together for good. He doesn't say it's all good. He's not, he's not demeaning your pain in the middle of things. He's, he's real about the fact that some things are just not good. But God works all things together for good. Think about it this way. Like this cup contain, doesn't right now contain it, but it would contain the, one of the best things known to mankind. Black coffee, right? I love black coffee. I love it. I used to love black coffee um, with a lot of cream and a lot of sugar, right? I used to pile it full of cream and pile it full of sugar, but at the end of the day, you know what I couldn't taste was black coffee. Now, you don't have to agree with me. Some of you are like, ooh, coffee tastes like dirt. And I want you to know there are a certain percent of the world's population that thinks that coffee tastes terrible. And that's just, it's a genetic thing. It's okay, right? But you don't have to agree with me to understand what I'm saying. I think that coffee is amazing. I love the way it smells, right? I love the way it tastes. And when you're able to experience black coffee the way that the roasters and the growers and all those people really want you to experience, you get the fullness of what it is. But can we talk about something? That as good as coffee is, the ingredients are not good, right? Here I have the, the, uh, I have the um, ingredients, one of the main ingredients. There's only really two in coffee. The first one is coffee beans. Coffee beans smell good, right? But they don't taste good at all, right? Ugh. That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't taste good at all. And here I have uh, one of the other ingredients. The other main ingredient in coffee is just piping hot water, right? If I pour a little bit of hot water into this cup and I, and I say, okay, coffee's good, and this ingredient is, isn't good, maybe it's this one that's good, because it's got to be, right? Yeah, hot water, just plain old hot water, not really good at all, is it? The truth is that the ingredients that go into coffee are not good, but what comes out of coffee is good. Now listen, we're going to talk about that today. What is it that God means when he says that he works all things together for good of those who love him, called according to his purpose? How is it that God takes not good ingredients and makes something so good out of it? How is it that God takes not good ingredients in your life, in my life, in our lives? How is it that God takes not good and makes something so good? What does he do? There's a story in scripture of, of one of God's prophets. His name's Elijah. And Elijah is a, a pretty crazy leader. He's a pretty crazy prophet. He's got guts when everybody else doesn't have guts. And they are in the middle. This whole land is in the middle of a drought. It's a three year drought. Now we've been in a drought around West Tennessee for a little while here. And we've been out without some rain. You need, you need rain for 
crops to grow. Maybe you're a farmer and you farm some gland and you're like, man, three-year drought would really kill me, right? And others of you depend on rain. Like a friend of mine owns a uh, basement waterproofing company, not in West Tennessee. He's over in Virginia. He owns a basement waterproofing proofing company and he depends on rain because if you're, if you're in the middle of a drought, they don't know that they need waterproofing. So he needs it that way. I need rain because it makes the fairways and the greens green, right? And so we all depend on rain in a different way. And the reality is that when rain doesn't happen, man, crops become in short supply. And so they were in the middle of a three-year drought that led to a terrible famine. And God told Elijah, he said, I want you to go and talk to the king. I want you to go to talk to the king and tell him that this thing's going to end and there's going to be a change in the way things are going. And when he walked in, this is what's crazy, he walked in to see King Ahab. Now, King Ahab knew that he was the guy who said, hey, this, this drought's coming. So he wasn't a big fan of Elijah. And so when he walked in, you can kind of imagine how this meeting first went. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? Like, you're the one who told me about this famine. You're the one who told me about this drought three years ago. I have made, and, but, he, but he, says, uh, he says, I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. That's a, a big deal. That he's said, listen, you have, you've, you've worshipped these other gods, you're the troublemaker. I love Elijah because he's got guts, but he doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't stop with just like, hey, you're the troublemakers. He goes on one step further and he says, now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel. He's like, look, here's the deal. Like we've been in the middle of this drought. We've been in the middle of this famine. Now you're calling me a troublemaker. He's like, no, you're the troublemaker. It's you and your family that are leading people astray. And he said, I'm about done with it. And I'm not just going to talk trash to you. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And he says, here's the deal. I'm going to put a dare on the table. Get the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah and supported by Jezebel. Like he said, bring them. Bring the representatives of the gods that you've gotten the people to do, and we're going to put it all on the line. And so what he does is he puts a dare, and he says, listen, I want you to do something. I want you to get a bull, and I want you to put this bull on an altar that you make, and I want you to get the 450, the 450 prophets of Baal, and I want you to get the 400 prophets of Asherah, and I want you to bring them all together, and I want them to do all their stuff, and I want them to call down fire from heaven. Cloud nine moment for Elijah. He's like, call down fire from heaven, and if your God is real, he'll send down fire to prove that he's real. And here's what, he, I'll do the same thing. I'm going to build an altar, and I'm going to put a bull on it, and I'm going to pray that God would do it. Now, here's the deal. What's crazy about how this works out is, uh, is there, he lets them do it. They start early in the morning. They build the altar. They put the bull on it. They start dancing, and they're running around. They're even cutting themselves. They're getting loud, right? And for three hours, it says about noontime, right? It says that for about three hours, they just call and dance. And here's what I love about, about Elijah. Not only does he go in and talk to Ahab, and he says, no, you're the troublemaker. Not only does it dare him to this like contest of putting God against God, right? It, not only does he do that, but then at noon, it says this. At noontime, Elijah began mocking them. This is my kind of dude, right? He's trash talking, right? He says, you'll have to shout louder, he scoffed. This is the best part. I had to read it to you because you aren't going to believe it's in the Bible. He says this, for surely he is a God. Perhaps he's daydreaming. I love this. Or relieving himself. <laughs> That's good stuff. Maybe he's taking a leak, right? Or maybe he's on his tr away on a trip. Or he's asleep and needs to be awakened. you got to yell louder so he pays attention. And he kind of sits back. But it's real now, isn't it? But it's not just trash talking. Trash talking is when you don't have what it takes to put up behind it. I mean, you're just talking trash, but you might wind up. But he knows full well that the gods of Baal are not real. They don't exist. And they can dance and scream and cut themselves and go crazy in the whole thing. But at the end of the day, he isn't real, so he cannot respond. And so then he decides, okay, it's my turn. So he makes the altar, puts the bull up on top. And then he says, hey, go get some water. Remember, it's a drought. 
Water's in short supply. So he dumps buckets and buckets of water on top of the altar. And then he digs a trench around it and fills it up, right? Fills it up with water. And he just comes up and he just says one really simple prayer. He says this, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you're, God, that you're the God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that all I have done is at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself and immediately. Now listen, they, they chanted for hours, right? He dared them. He talked trash to them. He prays one simple prayer and immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from above the heaven and burned up the young bull and the wood and the stones and the dust and even licked up all of the water in the trench. I mean, Matt, that's a powerful moment, right? That's a crazy second, right, for Elijah. He's standing on cloud nine. I have won the battle, right? I brought it. Elijah, keeping it 100, you know, like all in all the time. He's for real in it and he's all trenched, right? And he didn't expect what was next. You see the 400 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of, of, of Jezebel, like all these, he pulls them all together and has them all killed. And that does not make one person very happy. Jezebel. Jezebel is, is by all means evil. She led these prophets of, of Asherah, and, and she was none happy that he slaughtered all of them, none happy to be embarrassed this way. And Jezebel issues a letter, and she sent it immediately. It says, so Jezebel sent this message directly to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. So now all of a sudden, Elijah goes, from cloud nine. And all that God has done, which is pretty powerful, right, is now in the rear view mirror. And he can remember that God has done something, but he's in the middle of a new crisis, in the middle of a difficult situation like what Chris talked about tomorrow or last week. And now he has this issue that he has to deal with, is am I going to live like I have faith or gratitude for what's in the future? like it's already happened yesterday, or am I going to live in the despair of this moment? Because Jezebel is powerful and capable, and she's evil, and she's after him, and he is 100% alone. He's 100% alone. It's like bitter ingredient number one, right? He's completely alone. He's on the run. He can't make heads or tails out of where the hope is in the story. And he knows that he knows that something that he's experiencing is overwhelming to him. And this is exactly where we've been for this whole series. Knowing what God has done in the past is valuable. It's important, right? And understanding or remembering what God has done. And then also having confidence that God is at work today in the middle of my difficult circumstances. So crucial. But knowing that God is up to more than I can imagine, like Chris talked about. Having faith and gratitude tomorrow, man, that's where the real challenge is, isn't it? It's, inter it's easy to be grateful for what God has done. It's, it's important for us to, to know that he's up to more than I can ask and imagine, but having gratitude for what God will do in the future, man, that's where faith really comes in. And what happens next is then he went alone into the wilderness. Man, he was he was in despair, right? He's alone and he's on the run and he's in a place where there's no hope. He's traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Man, now my guess is there's more than one of us in this room who, like me, have experienced thoughts of suicide. Maybe you've been there. And I don't say that, that there's more than one of us in this room, more than one of us online who's, who have experienced thoughts of suicide. I don't say that because I know it's that common. I know that because you and I have the same enemy. That we have exactly the same enemy who Jesus said exists to steal, kill, and destroy. 
So can I just give you a pro tip from inside? Can I tell you what, what like a real life disciple of Jesus feels like? A pro tip. When you, when you see your life joy being stolen, when you see death surrounding you, when all you can see is destruction, you need to know that the enemy is hard at work getting you to taste the bitter ingredients rather than the beautiful outcome. That's exactly what was going on, right? He was, he was standing in the worst ingredient. He gets this letter saying that he's, he's got bitter ingredient number one. All of the power of Jezebel is after him. Then he finally just goes to rest and sits underneath a broom tree and just begs to die. Loneliness and despair. Bitter ingredient number two. Bitter ingredient number two is hard to swallow. And it's a pretty profound moment in his life. And what happens and, uh, is that God begins to minister to him. He cares for him under this broom tree. Sends the angel of the Lord, which is, a, again, a pre-incarnate Jesus, shows up and wakes him up and says, Hey, Elijah, you got to wake up. Underneath this broom, you can't live in despair. You've got to know that I'm up to something bigger. And he feeds him and he gives him water and he lets him rest. Then he wakes him up the next day and he gives him some more food and some more water. And he begins the process of, of taking the bitter ingredients and making something far, far better, right? And it's a difficult, grueling process. It's painful for him. But he cares for him. And then he wakes him up and he says, all right, you've had enough to eat, enough to drink. It's time to get on your way. And so he sends him on his way, still being hunted by Jezebel, still feeling alone, still feeling in despair. God gives him what he needs and moves him on his way and moves him. And eventually God, Elijah finds his way to a cave and he rests in the cave. And the angel of the Lord again comes to him and says, Elijah, come on, time to wake up. Go out to the, go out to the mouth of the cave and I'm going to meet you there. And he begins to add the bitter ingredients together to make something so much more valuable, so much more helpful and useful to him. And he says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as, and as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty wind storm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Man, isn't that how it is in the middle of our terrible circumstances when the bitter ingredients are being combined and we're almost overwhelmed by it, right? We can't even make sense out of all the bitterness and all of the pain and all the hurt, right? In the middle of the darkness, God comes by and we're looking for God, right? We're looking for him in the big things. God, are you going to show up in my relationship and do a miracle? God, are you going to, are you going to fix this tumor? Is it going to shrink this time when I look at it? Are we going to, and God wasn't in the, in the wind. God wasn't in the fire or God wasn't in the earthquake. God wasn't in the earth, wind or fire, right? He was still in the gentle whisper telling you that he cares about you. And that's what crazy is what's crazy about that verse that those well-meaning but kind of dumb Christians come in and say it's all good but it's not all good is it the ingredients themselves are not good right the ingredients themselves are not good at all they're bad the divorce that you're going through it's bad the, the diagnosis that you're struggling with is bad. The loss of a loved one is bad. There is nothing good about it. But remember what Paul does say, that God, he works all things, not just the good things, not just the bad things. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And what's so crucial for you and I to understand is that God is at work, like Chris said last week, doing more than I could ask or imagine. And he sits with me. And he's not looking to move in the fire or the wind or the earthquake or the big waves. See, that he sits with us and cares about us. Psalm chapter 34 says it this way. 
I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from my fears. Look, uh, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadows of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds me and defends all who fear him. Here's where God really meets us, isn't it? In the middle of our fears. He meets us in the middle of our shame, in the middle of our troubles, in the middle of our despair, in the middle of our desperation. He comes, and what does he do? He doesn't sympathize with us. He doesn't go, man, I hate that you're hurting. He empathizes with us. He takes it on himself. He listens. Isn't that the most valuable thing? In the quiet whisper of a listen? Just somebody who hears and understands and feels our pain with us. Now here's the crazy part. The next verse is the most powerful part. The next verse of the story, after he says, I prayed and he answered me in the middle of my fears, and after he, he cares about me in the middle of my darkness, and in my desperation he listens, after all of this, what, what does the psalmist say? The next part of it, it's really the most profound part. The next part of it is this. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's like, listen, there's definitely a lot of bitter ingredients that go into life. But God, who listened to me in the middle of my fears, combines or works together all of the things so that good can come out of them. So taste and see that the Lord is good. 